Hello and welcome to this Total War Warhammer 2 Rise of the Tomb Kings Let's Play. This time, Guy and myself will be taking on a head-to-head -head campaign with yours truly as the King of Kings, the Ruler of the Four Horizons, the Majestic Emperor of the Shifting Sands, Cetra the Imperishable. And I'll be taking control of the Lich King himself, Arkan the Black. As it's a head-to-head -head campaign, we'll be able to take over the AI to cause maximum grief for each other in their key battles. Wheels and I will be racing for five of the books of Nagash we need to finish the Tomb King's campaign, so there should be lots of opportunities to foil each other's plans. As there's lots to get through, we'll be jumping to highlights of our campaign. Both the Tomb King legendary lords that we'll be playing as start their campaign in the deserts of the Southlands. Most notably, Setra starts in the once great capital of Nehekara, Kemri. The first point of interest is at turn six, where I was given a tough choice between a few hero characters. I could recruit, or I could get a cash sum of 3.5 big ones. Money is hard to come by in the Tomb Kings campaign, but I elected to go for the Necrotect, and you're about to find out why. The Necrotect's forte is strengthening the incredibly powerful late game construct unit type that the Tomb Kings have access to. Although I don't have many of those at my disposal yet, the Necrotect's going to serve another function for me. By performing an action with a Necrotect hero, I can unlock the Great Incantation of Petra, one of the four new rites of the Tomb Kings. This allows me to instantly establish a level 3 settlement for the cost of a 4,000 gold rite. So let's move our new Necrotect over to Cetra's army, where he can support the War Sphinx that Cetra starts with, as well as improving his mobility on the campaign map. Nice, the rite has been unlocked. Let's pay that 4,000 gold and get ourselves a new settlement. Fast forward a couple of turns and we can move Petra's Necrotect into Zandri. This not only gives us early access to some higher tiered buildings, but it also paves the way for new trade routes across the seas. Trade can be very valuable for the Tomb Kings. Not only does it provide another source of income for their weaker economy, but it also gives access to the various trading resources across the map that can be used to craft new items such as armor, weapons, and enchanted items in the Mortuary Cult. I'll be able to use those resources to awaken the epic Legions of Legend to serve in my armies. These guys are like regiments of renown on steroids and will serve me well in my battles with Guy. Speaking of which, let's see what he's been up to. Wheels might have a bunch of jacked up skeletons fighting for him, but playing in the traditional Total War style, he's neglecting the primary focus of the Tomb King's campaign, the mighty books of Nagash. All around the New World are scattered the nine books of Nagash, ancient legendary tomes imbued with various powerful campaign effects. As Arkan the Black, I have an affinity with vampire factions and even have access to a small selection of their units thanks to the ninth book of Nagash, which Arkan starts with. You can see here in my starting settlement, Wizard Caliph's Palace, I've built the tier three ancient burial mound, which allows me to recruit up to four Felbats, Direwolves, and Crypt Ghouls, as well as a unit of Hex Wraiths. As touched on by Wheels, the Tomb King's economy works very differently to all the other races in the game. It can be a struggle to rack up serious money, but this is a small trade-off because the Tomb Kings do not pay recruitment or upkeep costs. Instead, every recruitment building will increase the maximum amount of that type of unit that you can field. The only exception being Skeleton Warriors and Spearmen, these cannon fodder units are extremely fragile, but can be pumped out en masse. So far, I've not done a whole lot of conquering, but I have been crushing the neighboring Bretonians and making an initial move south by taking the Arabian city of El Calabad. I've doubled back to make a risky run at the Books of Nagash located a short hop across the Great Ocean in Lustria. I've activated the Worship of Asaf commandment to quell some of my public order issues whilst I'm crusading across the ocean, but my home province is wide open. It is really a case of limiting the amount of territory I bleed in exchange for the huge buffs of the Books of Nagash. Back to me, it's Wheels again, and we've been busy. Firus is now under our control, and we have a foothold in the coast of Araby, which means I'm now sharing a province with the treacherous Arkham the Black, aka Guy. Back in turn 24, I recruited my first Legion of Legend via the Mortuary Cult. Flock of Jaff is no standard carrying unit. It adds armor piercing, flaming attacks, and a death from above ability to rain fire on your enemies. I had to spend 100 of my Canopic Jars here, a new currency used by the Tomb Kings, but I think it's worthwhile. These boys will give me a huge boost in my War with Guy, as they're sure to give me air superiority. Meanwhile, I've moved one of my fleets up to Lothurn so I can initiate some trade with the High Elves, and I've also been grabbing treasure from the open seas to boost my cash reserves. 
Whilst I was in the area, I thought I'd glance over at Cobra to see how well defended Guy's borders are. Lo and behold, it looks abandoned. After taking on one of his armies down south as the AI, and remember this is a head-to-head -head we're playing today, I'm pretty sure he's not in position to hold this settlement. In other words, target acquired. Ah, bad news. A turn later and a storm has rolled in right on top of my scouting force. I don't fancy taking a bunch of attrition in this perilous looking reef either, so I'm going to wait for backup and march Cetra's forces into reinforcement range, just in case my second force does run into any trouble. I was going to ask for military access from these Bretonians to my west, but Cetra doesn't ask. Cetra rules. Uh oh. Looks like the jig is up and Wills has bypassed the Bretonians and launched a full assault on my northern territory of Kofa. Time for me to pop my first ride. The Great Incantation of Kassar will unleash a nasty attrition causing sandstorm on all my territories and should slow down Wills until I can muster some defensive forces. A few turns later and I finally caught up with the Book of Nagash, which I'm hoping will turn the tides of this campaign. If I can acquire it from this nasty looking rogue army, I'll gain an extra stack to help rid my home turf of its cetra shaped infestation. You see, as well as having unit caps, the Tomb Kings also have a limit on the number of armies they can do. This is linked to dynasties they can unlock in their version of the tech tree. Dynasties will increase your army cap by one, as well as unlocking special themed upgrades for your armies and powerful named lords. However, they do take a considerable amount of time to unlock, and each one will decrease your research rate, which will slow your progress to the next one. This book, then, can act as a huge power spike if used correctly. Because Tomb Kings are free of recruitment and upkeep costs, the extra stack can rise with zero impact on my economy and will give me thousands of extra troops to allow me to overpower wheels with skeletons galore. I still have to win it though, and return home with a respectable army, and that could prove extra difficult with wheels in command of this fusion of Chevron, Chaos and Dark Elves units. Well, the book is mine, thanks to my new favourite unit in the game, the Tomb Scorpion. This guy started with me in my campaign and was a force of nature, single-handedly wiping out the vast majority of the high-tier Witch Elves, which Wheels so negligently left to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with my bad boy, Tomb Scorpion. Also, a quick shout-out to the vampire arm of my forces, the brave Bats and Wolves who so honourably sacrificed themselves to tie up Wheels' Dark Shards and artillery until I could snipe his flimsy hybrid lord. Oh, I've had no luck with this weather. Guy's sandstorm slowed me down a few turns. But it did give me time to recruit these Ushabti and Nekaharan warriors. Which allowed me to sweep through two of Guy's settlements. I've decided to go straight for the jugular and pounce on his capital. I know he was off gallivanting in Lustria, and I took a big chunk out of his primary forces over there, despite his victory. And I think I've been too quick for him to recover from that. Let's rewind a few turns, because Wheels is in for a bit of a surprise. Using the incantation of Tahoth allowed me to recruit a powerful Casket of Souls unit, and also granted me plus three Lord Recruit rank, as well as plus two Unit Recruit rank. After my costly battle with the rogue army protecting the Book of Nagash, I folded my tattered second stack into Arkhan's main forces, meaning when my second dynasty finally finished researching, I had a total of three lords to recruit back home and two regions worth of local recruitment, churning out many, many skellies. I can also instantly call on King Nakesh's Scorpion Legion, which I unlock when I can reach level 10. Let's not forget the extremely powerful Casket of Souls. And with one of my Lords in the Entombed stance, I can use Global Recruitment as well. I think that's enough to tip the scales in my favour. The fool has fallen into my trap. Time to move in my secondary forces and end this once and for all.
Thanks for watching and I hope you've enjoyed this head-to-head -head Rise of the Tomb Kings Let's Play. Make sure to jump to the Steam page in the description below to pre-order Rise of the Tomb Kings now.